Hey guys, this is Phil with the Storm Riders, and in this video we'll be doing something several of you have been asking for, going over some gameplay. Now, the Storm Riders are all about sharing our knowledge with our viewers, so this video won't be a typical gameplay video. What we're going to do is explain not only the game objective, but also talk about the strategy we used, as well as the reason why we used it. Hopefully, this will help shed some light on how strategic thinking works, both in theory and in practice. So, let's set the scene. This is a map of the play area. On the right, you can see a village field with several small buildings. Along the bottom is a small forested area and a road leading into the village. On the lower left is a fort in the woods called Big Fort, and middle left, a big open field with trenches called the D-Day Field. Finally, along the top is another wooded area. The goal of the game is for the attackers to overtake the village defenders and get inside within a 30 minute time limit. The defenders need to keep this from happening. The attackers would start both on the D-Day field and in the big fort and could respawn from these locations. The defenders would respawn from the two-story structure in the bottom right. The first step before any match is to talk strategy. For the Storm Riders, this usually means the team leader comes up with a rough strategy and gets thoughts and opinions from the other team members. Once a final plan is agreed on, the team leader will assign people to perform the various tasks that are required. In this case, we decided that we wanted to focus our defensive lines in two main areas. One area was in the bottom left of the village. We determined that most players would want to take the road to assault the village, as it has the most cover. We placed defenders in the structures here, as well as one person on overwatch in the two-story structure on the right, in order to provide point fire as well as spoil any attack from the lower middle and lower right areas. We also expected an attack from the top wooded area, so we placed defenders in the middle left structure as well as the tire barricades in the top right corner. Finally, we kept two players in reserve as floaters in the center of the village to assist any area of the village that needed additional firepower. As soon as the ref blew the whistle, we started passing along information about enemy numbers and positions to each other. D-Day, they're behind the tank. On the road! We also provided as much fire as we could, but found that we received a withering amount of fire in return. A few minutes into the game, Chris started experiencing difficulties with his primary weapon system and had to fall back to our respawn oh, to troubleshoot. Right now. I've got rifle problems. In the bottom left side of the village, Cal was providing effective point fire against the big fort. He was effectively pinning them, however he was taking a fair amount of fire in return. From my overwatch position in the two-story structure, I could see that the enemy forces on D-Day field had not crossed upward into the wooded area as we had expected. After a few minutes, Chris advised us that his primary was back up and running, and that he was moving into position to help Cal in the bottom left side of the village. When Cal was hit, Chris was able to move in and take up his position in order to maintain our volume of fire. This ensured that the enemy was not able to capitalize on this opportunity. Entrance to the safe zone. Entrance to the safe zone. Since most enemy forces were attacking from the road, and not from the top wooded area as we had expected, I had Mark relocate to the two-story structure where he could be more Stop. effective with his long-range rifle. Mark, get up to old two-story. As Cal respawned and moved to regain his initial position, Chris's primary went down a second time, putting Chris out of the fight temporarily. Cal managed to reach his initial position, but Chris's gun was down for good. What he decided to do was be support for the team, by providing an extra set of eyes for command and control, as well as running ammunition for players who were starting to run low. At roughly the halfway point, we decided to review how our strategy was working. Although the enemy was not making good progress getting into the village, we were also not able to inflict casualties on them because they were very well entrenched behind their cover. We decided to modify our strategy a little bit and pull our defensive line back about 15 or 20 feet. All right, what we're going to do here, Stefan, I want you to pull back your defensive line, move back one row of buildings. Oh, yeah. Let them come in, buddy. This was a bit of a gamble, because Still letting the enemy the get closer here. to their objective would make it easier for them to win the game. However, tank, Mark, in tank. order for them to get closer the to the village, they would need to leave their advantageous cover positions, which would make it easier for us to take them out. Ultimately, the gamble paid off, and the enemy took the bait. 
enemy players started to leave their positions of cover in order to get oh, closer to the village, the at which point we were easily able to take them out, forcing them to go respawn and run down the game timer. Once we reached the final minutes of the game, we substantially increased our volume of fire in order to keep the enemy pinned in their positions. As a result, the enemy was not able to gain any ground and we were victorious. This was a perfect example of how strategic thinking and tactical flexibility combine to bring success on the That's battlefield. Game. It's important to have a plan before every game, but it's equally important to be flexible with that plan as a tactical situation changes. We hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the box below, and make sure to hit subscribe to stay up to date with our most recent content. Thanks for watching.